Hey guys, if you listen to this podcast, you or someone you know has probably been a victim of spiritual abuse. In addition to educating us all about these harmful groups, Coltish is proud to partner with Be Emboldened, a nonprofit dedicated to finding freedom from spiritual abuse. The founder, Naomi Wright, has been a guest on our show more than once. She shared her own personal story with us, which is something we really appreciate about Be Emboldened. They have the education and the training, but they also just get it on a personal level. It makes the special opportunity they have for cultish listeners today that much better. Be Emboldened provides excellent resources and practical help from trained professionals to walk alongside survivors, their loved ones, and church leaders and professionals seeking to serve this very real and growing need more effectively. They know that the cost of professional mentoring, expert consulting, and top-notch digital courses can be tough, though they're excited to announce a new way for everyone to access help, hope, and healing. With Be Emboldened's brand new Plus membership, you'll gain access to the exclusive content, expert mentoring, thought-provoking blogs, curated content, discounts, and more. Check out their new BE Plus membership at beembolden.com forward slash membership and use the code COLTISH50 at checkout for 50% off your first month subscription. That's COLTISH50 for 50% off. Here's to living out freedom. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. You might hear some noise in the background. That's because we are not in our studio. We are not in Andrew's super secret headquarters, which I can uh, I can either confirm or deny if that location will be disclosed in this podcast. But we are in Simpsonville, Kentucky. We are doing a podcast uh, live, uh, at least at this time when it's recorded. Uh, you're hearing it later at uh, in Simpsonville, Kentucky, at the Cult of Freedom Conference. You've heard it advertised uh, it's been a great couple of days. Andrew, you've really enjoyed Both of us have been able to speak so far. Uh, <clears throat> what have you thought about this conference so far? Yeah, I think the conference is extremely important because there's a large demographic of people in the United States that are coming out of a workspace religion. And it's a demographic that not many people really know about. And right now it's hot in the media, right? Uh, people deconstructing, quote unquote. But the beautiful thing about this conference is not about deconstruction. It's about disentangling from what isn't actually even biblical teaching. Yeah, right? It's disentangling and learning what God actually teaches about grace and faith and freedom in the Bible. Yeah, and not just disentangling. I almost would call it like rediscovery, like tasting it again for the first time. And that's something that uh, we're actually talking with Jennifer. Uh, thanks for all for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Exciting so yeah, and like so you talked yesterday afternoon and man, it was incredibly touching. Um, well, let's jump right into it. Just tell everyone just quickly about your back. And we're going to shuffle through a couple of people at this conference, but For now, uh, just tell them like your kind of background or sort of what led you to this conference. Yeah, so I grew up a Trinity Pentecostal holiness, and that came with a lot of expectations on my standards and my performance. A lot of extra biblical things that aren't in the Bible, but you're expected to follow to be a good Christian. And it, for me, really led me into a lot of pride. I became very prideful in those standards and thought that that made me a better Christian than just your average Christian. And so uh, looking back on all of it, I really started just trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean to be a Christian without all of these extra standards? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to walk in the freedom of the gospel um, without having the expectation of earning your salvation with all of these extra things? What are some of the standards, for example? Um, Some of the extra standards would be not wearing pants, women having really long hair, I couldn't wear nail polish, makeup, jewelry, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, it's a lot of your hyper-fundamentalism, um, average standards that I feel like go across many denominations. Yeah. No, and then, um, so even like right now, even like what you're right now, the fact that yeah. your full arm is yeah. like showing there's certain people from your back when even right. your old self would yeah. see you right now and just would be just deer in the headlights oh, in like fight or flight mode. Oh, absolutely. And it's really wild looking back now because... Um, it's, it's a whole new world. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people that come out of these hyper fundamentalist churches or the hyper controlled groups, um, it takes a lot of time to figure out, okay, what am I comfortable with? Mm-hmm. Who was I? Who am I going to be? What do I want to walk in? Uh, what am I comfortable with? Right. Not what all these expectations that have been put on me, mm-hmm. but like, what does it look like for me? Yes. And, and I mean, it was very interesting too, because I mean, you had a mindset of all these, uh, you took a lot of pride in all the different yeah. external appearances, but the real challenge for you, which you talked about yesterday, was a lot of the medical issues that you yeah. faced. Explain that to our audience about how that affected you and what the catalyst was that towards 
Yeah. Now, where you end up landing at? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with five different chronic illnesses. Um, one of them called Chiari malformation. And basically my brain was too big for my skull and it was pushing into my spine. And so my uh, brain fluid was filling my spine up and um, I was starting to lose some motor skills. And um, through all of that, I had to have brain surgery. They removed a piece of my skull and my first vertebrae to give my brain more room. Um, and it was like massive for me. It was a huge shift in my life because I thought, well, I'm a good Christian. Bad things shouldn't happen to me. And mm. it really caused me to figure out, OK, well, I've performed so well for all these people in my life and for God. So I'm sick. What does that look like now? Yeah. What is that? How do I move forward and figure out what Christian um, values really, truly are? Because I thought that because I was such a good Christian, bad things sh like this shouldn't happen. Wow. So another, what mm. did, no, go ahead. Andy. Yeah. So were you told like you're sick because probably something you did? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, not by my family. My family was not that way at all. But it was like the exterior people in the church and like other other voices coming in and saying, oh, well, you must have done something really bad. Mm. You must have done something really bad to deserve this. Wow. Um, and now it's kind of crazy because I was like, no, I'm perfect. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm me? Never. Yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. Right. Um, but it's so crazy because I was, I was actually full of my own pride. You know, I did have sin in my heart. None of us are perfect. But to say specifically that I had like one act or maybe I thought about trimming my hair, like did that cause me to have to have mm -hmm. brain surgery? Yeah. Or did that cause me to want to, yeah. you know. And we're dealing with a very cliff note story, kind of like <laughs> yesterday. But, um, and who knows, maybe we could figure out a time to have you on later on to kind of further unravel yeah. uh, your whole story. But what would you say would be the main sort of initial, like, catalysts or sort of like seeing the other edge of the looking glass for the first time where you begin to really wonder, well, what if this is not really everything that the gospel truly is? Right. Like everything, because it's almost, you think about everything that you were promised was freedom mm -hmm. that ended up sort of being turned on its head in regard to dealing with this sickness. Right. Right. But like, what was the point that was like, wait a minute, that where God, you say like God started to like really show your eyes what, what true freedom meant. Because that's really, you think about our part then, converts here where it's you know, rediscovering freedom called to freedom right. with Galatians. Like what was that for you? Yeah, for me, I, it wasn't until I had multiple major life events happen, me being sick, one of them and realizing that I had no idea what I believed. Yeah. Like I, I, I had done what I've been told, but I truly like in my heart of hearts did not know mm. uh, what I believed. And I did not have the scripture. I had the, the scripture specifically that I had been told to quote over and over, you know how it goes. Yeah. It's like I had those, but like the deep context of the scriptures, I, no idea. And mm -hmm. so when I, when I realized that I didn't know, I was like, well, let's find out, let's read the Bible and see what the Bible says. And so, I started digging into God's word. I started listening to a lot of sermons from um, uh, well-known preachers that were outside of my specific movement and mm -hmm. just started trying to figure out, okay, what they said, does this match with God's word, the, what I just read? Yeah. And it was a lot of, um, oh, eyes being opened, heart, my heart just slowly started shifting and, and it led me down a whole journey. I had no intention of leaving all of my standards at all. It was just me wanting truth. Right. And that led me into being like, Oh, my life is a lie. And what was one of the first like uh, doctrines from some of these preachers that you were listening to where you're like, whoa, that's what the Bible actually teaches? What was one of the first ones? I think uh, there was a specific sermon that I'm thinking of by Matt Chandler, and he was just talking about grace. Hmm. And I and I remember sitting in my bedroom, probably on the floor at this point, watching the sermon on my computer and bawling my eyes out, being like, I've worked so hard for nothing. Mm. I've worked so hard the last 20 years of my life for what? Yeah. And it was like, God's grace is so free. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to pay for it when he already paid for all of it. Wow. Yeah. So now like a rediscover of the gospel, I think without, because a lot of people would have the same experience and background that you'd have, but they'd go down a route of, you know, deconstruction, right. which we see a lot. Yeah. What was the difference for you? Um, yeah. I think for me, I felt a pull in my spirit. I, I, I wanted truth and I knew that God was real. I had seen his faithfulness, even though I didn't have a amazing relationship with him or I didn't really know what I believe. Like I seen his faithfulness. I, I had felt his spirit and I knew that he was real and I did not want to walk away 
from everything, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people said that to me. Um, and I thought about that a lot of, I don't want to leave Jesus. Right. And then when I actually got to know who Jesus truly was and the character of God, it was how I wouldn't want to leave this. Like, yeah. this is the truth. This is amazing. My eyes have been opened and, and walking with him is so much better than walking in sin because I was walking in sin before. Yeah. You know, and I, yeah. I talked a little bit in my story yesterday about how I had also had a lot of anxiety and I was also in sexual sin. So there was all of these sexual sins that I put away and left behind and started actually walking in the freedom of the gospel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But the holiness standards that you were adhering to never stopped the indulgence of the flesh. Like it right. says in Colossians two. Right. And like, say, say you flip flopped and you were, you were very sick. You're going through surgery, things like that. And you start denying God. Uh, then what purpose do you have even for your sickness right. anymore? You know, right. like, is that something that made you kept clinging to God? It's like, well, if God isn't here and God isn't real, my sickness is for no reason. I have right. no purpose. Oh, absolutely. I think that was a very big thing too. There was so many things in my life that I was like, no, Jesus has to be real. Mm -hmm. You know, the word of God has to be real. And I've seen it proved over and over. Right. There, for me, there wasn't really another option. Right. I just ran to him instead of away from him because I felt like for the for a very long period of time in my life, I did run from him, mm -hmm. you know, trying to fulfill all of these desires in my heart. And I and I finally got tired of it and was like, OK, it's time to come home. It's wow. time to wow. actually figure out what I believe and be in the father's arms and yeah. rest. Yeah. Also, let me ask you this too, because we, we talked about yesterday, yeah. uh, we were I was talking to you about my background of sort of coming in the background of purity culture, yeah. Joshua Harris, oh, um, you know, days. the breakaway magazine, the true love weights campaign oh, yeah. and all that. And it, it's very interesting because a lot of times the, a lot of people who are in groups, specifically women, when they're in groups with a lot of those rigid, rigid, you know, dress restrictions, they tend to really pendulum swing and their way to vicarious rebel against their own group is like promiscuity in, in many mm -hmm. ways. But you were talking about you know, yesterday, and I think you may have done it in your talk about sort of under, rediscovering like what like modesty really is. Yeah. Like what would be, you know, disentangling, kind of rediscovering what that is. Like what, what would you say, like knowing what you know now as a woman of God who, mm -hmm. who wants to do things that are pleasing to God, how would you like define that now versus how you defined it when you're in as according to holiness standards. Yeah. So I'll start with what I used to believe and what I used to think modesty was. Modesty was always like there to protect men primarily. Yep. It was there to be a guard, uh, to shield men from lust and keep men from sinning. And that's what I primarily thought it was, you know, covering yourself. And that was like the gist of it. Um, I now believe that modesty is so much more than clothing and it goes so much deeper into our heart. Mm -hmm. Modesty is simply humbleness. You know, that's why when somebody gives you a compliment and you kind of brush it off and they say, oh, you're just being modest. Yeah. You're being humble. You're being <laughs> humble before the Lord. You know, yeah. you have a humble spirit. And that goes way deeper than clothing. That, that should go in all areas of our lives. That should go into um, our hearts and our how we deal with our pride. And for me, I would spend, I talked about this in my story a little bit yesterday, but I, I would spend hundreds of dollars on high heels and fancy dresses and mm. big name purses. And I was so modest, you know, I was just so modest with all of my pride and it's a completely contradicting thing. So modesty, yeah. modesty really is about so much more. And I never heard it talked about to men, really mm. men, men and modesty didn't really go together. They like to take the verse in first Timothy where it talks about um, you know, the women in the church should adorn themselves in modest apparel and they leave it at that. And they, they use that verse to say that it's just for women, but that verse is specifically talking about women flaunting their wealth mm. in the church. So it's a whole deep dive into, yeah. into, um, it's about your heart attitude. It had nothing to do with lust. Yeah. It was about their hearts and the way that they were flaunting themselves. Mm -hmm. And so modesty and then, and then you're reading Galatians. This is amazing to me. And you're in Galatians that, that he says that there's neither Jew nor, nor um, Gentile and there's neither male nor female. So yeah. why, why would modesty just be for women? Mm -hmm. Humbleness is for all believers. Yeah. No, that's really good. And what would you say too, 
like so far in this conference, what has been your biggest aha moment? You went up and, and spoke, and we were able to speak yesterday. With all the talks, everything that's happened so far, mm-hmm. what what have you had any kind of big like aha moments or takeaways yeah. uh, just so far? What what's, what has it been like for you? Yeah, this is this conference has been so encouraging to my heart. There's so many people from so many different walks of life, so many different people that have walked um, a lot of really hard things. And for me, I think today, actually, I had a big aha moment. And it was when uh, Nathan Mayo, Natalie's brother, he said, people say walking in freedom means not following all these extra standards. But walking in the freedom of the gospel truly is about resting in our salvation. That yeah. Christ, Christ's sacrifice is enough. Yeah. Christ, what Christ did is enough. Mm. And that's what the freedom of the gospel is. It's yeah. not about doing whatever we want. It's not about um, living life however we see fit. It's literally about um, accepting his grace yeah. and what he's done for us. No, that's so good. And the fact, I just think of, uh, you know, I was talking in, in the talk that I gave about how Hebrews chapter, oh, the whole book of Hebrews is almost like a warning against deconstruction, people who want to leave that way. And one of the warnings against apostasy is like, be wary lest you don't enter into the rest of the Lord. You know, and that's that's one of the, the dire warnings. And so when you actually find that freedom, it is an area of rest. Yeah. And if you don't go there and if you do end up towards deconstruction, it really is a, an area of like restlessness. Right. And that's like the true freedom that you can find there. So that that was I don't know, this whole thing has been very open, opening for me. And I think it's been so awesome because uh, Jennifer Brewer, who's been one of the hosts of it, she's been on that. She was on the podcast forever ago. And. Like us being here is the fact that she had the courage to reach out to us all those years ago. Yeah. And here we are, you know, how now having this conversation, it's always just amazing to see the ripple effects of just how that works. Yeah. The, the connections that are being made, the friendships that like, I know that I'm going to still catch up with you guys online and we'll still be in touch. And, yeah. and so many friendships are being formed here where I really feel like it's a whole community of people that's going to keep going and mm. keep encouraging each other and have honest conversations and vulnerability and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through that. It's just so beautiful. Well, awesome. And just yeah. where, where can people find you online? We're going to jump on, have a couple of people jump on from the conference, but just real quickly, where can people find you on? You on are you, do you have your own podcast or you on, I know you've got a big uh, social media following up. Where can people find you at? Right yeah, now? so I don't have my own podcast yet. Um, I don't know if I ever will, but we'll <laughs> see what the Lord does with that. Um, you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Threads. That's a new thing. That's a new one. Yeah. Threads. Threads. Um, everything is just at Jen Brawler. So it's Jen, and then Brawler is B R A L L I E R. Okay, we'll we'll, uh, we'll put the, your text to some of your socials there if people can find. Perfect. It. Thank what? you guys so Absolutely. much. Absolutely, it's been a blast. Yeah, thanks yeah, for having me. God. Awesome. Absolutely. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's the Super Sleuth coming at you with the sponsor for this episode, which is Cornerstone Tea. You need to go to cornerstoneteacompany.com right now and get yourself some of the finest handcrafted fresh teas. It's insane, guys. Like, they have classic flavors like this chai right here, but this chai is cranked up to 11. It's high caffeine, and when you open this bad boy up, mmm, it just hits you with smells, man. You know, it's like, it's what I would think the Garden of Eden smells like. And guys, this is a Christian company. We should be supporting them. I know I've been drinking this tea while I've been sleuthing as well. The instructions to brew this tea are right here also on the front, which makes it super easy for you. And when they sent me this tea, guys, they also gave me some awesome stickers. Who doesn't like getting goodies? So enough about that. Let's talk about the company. The company is a business that seeks to keep God's kingdom at the center of operations through regular cost-specific tea blends to benefit missionaries and charities. That's right. Part of the proceeds goes to help the kingdom of God worldwide. Also, they have a comprehensive approach to nationwide wholesale where an optional service training and innovative exclusive tea blending come alongside this excellent product. So don't stop with just listening to this ad. Go to cornerstoneteacompany.com and use the code in all caps right here, cultish. 10, no spaces either, to get 10% off your first order. Get yourself some tea and change the way that you've been living your morning routine. Talk to you later, guys. All right, so we are, uh, like I said, we're at the Call to Freedom Conference, and we're just kind of shuffling through a couple of people who've been in the conference. So we are here with Leo. Is it Pastor Leo? Is that is that the title people uh, are giving you? Or? I, I, I mean, hey, don't go ahead and call me Pastor. Just a, <laughs> Leo is fine with me. Yeah. Leo is fine with me. <laughs> well, awesome, man. Just tell everyone about your background. I know you, you were on a panel. Yeah. We'll talk about that, about dealing with spiritual abuse. But yeah. So your background is that you were in the UPC, yes. and we did cover that forever ago. Mm-hmm. But you were a pastor in the UPC. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just tell everyone just about just about that real quickly. Yeah. Like, so, what was, so, yeah. um, so I was licensed, uh, I was licensed minister and a youth pastor. 
for within the UPC, and I was a part of them for 16 years. And um, you know, I um, I did everything in, in, in within the, our church, not just pastoring, but also you know just basic stuff like ushering, uh, outreach, um, teaching Bible studies, um, just going evangelizing, just doing a lot, uh, a lot of investment, a lot of commitment within the organization. But um, you know, after being there for so long and teaching, and also um, teaching uh, Bible Institute classes. Um, I began to start, you know, just studying about certain things that I had questions on, even while I was in there. Mm-hmm. And while I was in there, um, you know, the environment is very, um, very controlling in terms of like information. So it's a lot of information yeah. control, you know, so you're you're only allowed to like study certain things uh, based upon whatever they give you. And other things outside of that is kind of like considered suspect. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, so well, like um, like the Watchtower Track Society has magazines. So yeah. when you're studying the Bible in the institutes, there's yeah. like specific uh, curriculums. Yeah. So they have specific curriculums and most of it has come from Pentecostal Publishing House. That's what the UPC yeah. usually uses. And so a lot of my stuff was 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 just centered around that. And of course, other books that and within those within the Pentecostal Publishing House, you had specific people that had specific books that you had to read and ensure that you would utilize their information whenever you're giving out, you know, your, your, your teachings and so forth. So a lot of that was what I was using. But also every now and then they would you know, allow you to use some outside source information, which was non for us, non apostolic or non Pentecostal. And when, you know, you do stuff like that, you come into contact with things that they may not necessarily agree with. And it's, of course, that's when the questions start arising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember like when we did our initial studies and, you know, for them, like their it's a modalistic view of God. And so I know there's a primary theologian. I think his name started with a B, but it was um, he was the sort of like the main person that kind of be view, reviewed as an authority when it comes to. Just people within the oneness apostolic, they, they kind of see him as a revered theologian. I think you're talking about David Bernard. Yes, that, yeah, yes, David, David Bernard. Bernard yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah, by your last name, but all the yeah. same. <laughs> but yeah, you, you get the idea where it's like, mm-hmm. hey, this is you sort of centralize like your theology. Everything's centered around. You can only view it through how this person sees it. Yes, right? that's exactly true. Like most of the um, our books for minister ministerial license. Uh, almost 80% of the books are from him, from oh, wow. Bernard. And so he's considered to be revered as, you know, the one that has all the scholarship in terms of theology. Mm-hmm. So he had all kinds of books, you know, anything from holiness standards to uh, soteriology to the yeah. uh, divinity of God, how, you know, how we ought to perceive God to be in terms of modalism. Mm-hmm. So it was, he was, you know, and he's a lawyer, of course. Yeah. So oh, wow. how he words things, of course, is, is going to be very impactful for how we interpret scripture. Yeah. And so, you know, he was like, we would look at him as like, hey, he's the top guy. And so his books was always recommended and always given within um, our classes and our, in our um, even in our Bible schools. Did they mm. give him like a specific title, like Apostle David Bernard? So or? he is technically the superintendent of the UPC. So that is like, like the highest uh, position that you can hold within the UPC. But if you want to say he's like, you know, their, I don't know, Apostle Bishop. I mean, you could, you could say that, but for him, yeah, he's titled the superintendent. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and so you mentioned it was very interesting, and this is the case for a lot of people. Um, 2020, that yeah. was a very unique year, not just for you, but for a lot of people who are both in uh, different cultish-like groups, but mm-hmm. also in the New Age. A lot of people, that series of events, as crazy that year was, mm-hmm. like a lot of them were sort of the not going to church, going on Zoom, and it gave people a lot more free time than they expected, so they actually had a chance to think through things like you telling that story is like, I've heard that story so many times. Yeah, um, yeah, and now yeah. they tell everyone, like bring into everyone about that time and how that was a kind of a game changer for you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, pr- prior to COVID, I was already asking some questions, you know, about the standards, you know, why women can't wear pants, you know, why, why we can't wear jewelry. Why is it such a big deal with some of these unbiblical or yeah. extra biblical yeah. standards? So that was one thing. So I was pulling this tapestry that was pulling a thread. Yeah. As time progressed, you know, kids were asking me these questions, you know, why we can't do certain things. And I was like, well, because, you know, my pastor said so or because David Bernard, you know, he's yeah. <laughs> he's giving yeah. us all this wisdom. Yeah. But behind the scenes, you know, I'm just like un- uneased about some of these things. And then it went from standards to it went from the church culture, like what the type of church I was a part of. Very yeah. authoritarian. You know, you know, you really couldn't really say anything. You, you know, you can question. You can ask questions freely because everything had to be run by your pastor. He was like the, yeah. the final authority, not not God. So I was yeah. in a situation where I was like, okay, who do I trust? If I see something in scripture and I'm like, man, I have a question on this. And I don't see what the scripture is saying, what the, my pastor is saying. So I was in this dilemma, like, should I trust my pastor 
or should I trust the word of God? Yeah. And I was like, why am I even struggling with this? Why, why, why am I even asking which one should, <laughs> should well, I trust? Give, give us an example of one of the things that you were really struggling with. Yeah, so for example, like in the UPC back then, I think now it's starting to change in terms of the standards. But when I was in it, you know, men couldn't have beards. Oh, now you, you find gentlemen here have fully, you know, uh, robust beards. Yeah. <laughs> this is better than mine. Yeah. Right. But within the UPC, yeah. um, you know, clean shaven is, is, is the standard. And um, I guess, you know, it traces back to some history back in the, in the, in the 17th, in the 70s, I think, with the whole yeah. um, uh, hippie movement or whatever. Oh, but right. for whatever reason, they established this no beard policy and it became like not just the standard, but like a, a, a salvational issue, a, a holiness issue that if you had a beard, yeah. you were considered to be, you know, not spiritually mature. What did they do with Jesus having a beard and getting ripped out of his face before his, like, you know, they, they try and avoid that, even oh. though they would say, yeah, he had a beard, but, but, you know, culture has changed. So, so they would appeal to culture and yet they say, don't be like culture. And yet, yeah. you know, the, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. but then you have That's Jesus having a beard. So, yeah. So whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but that alone. So my pastor, for example, he was in the pulpit one day. Right. And he says as many times, but this one particular time, I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm almost having enough with this. Yeah. He said to yeah. me, he said to the audience, you know what? Um, if I could, if I can get all the men to gather together, I would gather them and, and they have beards. I'd gather them together and I'd burn all beards. I'd burn their beards off. Wow. Yeah. This is extreme stuff. Like, and that's just one of the many things that I just would always hear all the time. Yeah. So when he said that, and um, he said another thing about, you know, uh, if, 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 if women are wearing pants, then they're, it's an abomination. And all women who wear pants, they're going to go to hell for wearing pants. So, yeah. so I have this issue here with these standards yeah. that are becoming so uh, dogmatic that I began to question it. So let me go back in scripture and let me find, is there anywhere in the Bible that talks about beards being a sin? And there is not one scripture that I could appeal to. <laughs> I could, I could yeah. muster up to say, yeah, here is the reason why. There was more scriptures to support the wearing of beards, all the way from Genesis to, yeah. to, to the New Testament. There was nothing wrong with it. So, so, and then of course with pants, Deuteronomy twenty two five was like the scripture that you would use to say, hey, you know, women can't wear pants because Men's the Bible clothes. talks about yeah, yeah. And, and I'm and so I'm like, well, that's not really talking about pants because even back then they didn't wear pants. They gird wore. up your loins, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally different. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just having struggles with telling the the the, the youth this, and so in it, as as uh, you know before COVID, like I was saying, I had all these questions. But when COVID came, I was able to slow down from all the ministry work that we were doing, all the preaching and whatnot. Everything was kind of localized to being the Zoom and whatnot. But I just took time to study every particular thing that my organization was telling me was to be absolutely truth. And it was just pulling that thread. So the standards was just pulling apart. I was no longer convicted about the, the things that, you know, my group believed. Yeah. Then yeah. it went into soteriology. So I'm like, okay, if the standards are wrong, what else is wrong? And I began to study upon, 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 sal upon salvation. And they believed that you had to speak in tongues to be saved. Yeah. They believed you had to be baptized specifically by saying the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus and if you don't do those things, you're not saved. Yes, you have faith, you know, we're saved by, by grace through faith, but that's supposed to lead to obedience, which is, of course, doing these works, which I found out to be untrue. I listened to a whole bunch of podcasts during during COVID. I listened to debates between, for example, James White and David Bernard, yes, uh, James, yeah. James White and Sam Perkins and just, you know, just other other people, too. Um, but and it was just unfolding like, yeah, their theology is is, is misrepresenting scripture. This is not true. We are truly saved by grace through faith alone there isn't no additional works that we need to perform and if we do works it is to it's just to identify that we are christians it's, it's because we love jesus we're not doing works in order to be saved so yeah. that was that was just you know everything was just raveling from like i said uh, standards church culture and then the and then the uh, soteriology so uh when uh, as covid was progressing and so forth as time was going i finally had the courage to confront my pastor about, hey, I'm just having some some theological differences. And I was scared because, again, it's really authoritative. Like, you don't question yeah. these things. You're questioning yeah. not just that. You're questioning the whole denomination. Right? Everything. And they're the yeah. one true church. Everything. Yes. Yeah. Only yep. church. And they asked me to they asked me to start a, a, a church. They was asking me to go pastor a church. <laughs> So at this point, I'm like, you don't want me to pastor a church right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'll do some damage because I mean, I just I'm just not in a good position. But I went and I, I went humbly asking some questions. Here. I was like, hey, I'm looking at some scriptures and I'm just not seeing 
what I used to see anymore. And this was like a complete shock to them because I was I was always like brown nosing. I was there. I was committed. Whatever the pastor wanted, I was down. But at this point, couldn't do it anymore. I said, wow. hey, you know, this is not right. So it's my first time coming into the to my pastor. So there's a bishop and then there's a pastor. So the bishop's like overseeing everything. And yeah. the pastor that, you know, kind of coordinates the church mm. and everything. So I went to my pastor first. I said, hey, I'm having some theological, uh, theological differences. I don't know what to do now. And yeah. he was like, well, you know, if the bishop hears about this, mm-hmm. you know, it's not going to be good. So I said, I know, man, but I've been studying too much to, to not be in this position. Yeah. So then we go to the bishop. And when I went to the bishop, uh, he sat me down. He opened up his Bible and he's like, yeah, I heard you having some concerns about soteriology and about being born again and so forth. He's like, well, son, before I even started speaking, it, the, the, the room was already getting getting hot. And he said, hey, all right, well, here's what um, here's here's the thing. There's three comp- compartments in in hell. Right. And because you're a minister and you've been teaching the word. Well, if you teach anything other than what we're teaching. Because this is the absolute truth, is it not? Right? Before I even, yeah. I'm not even answering anything. <laughs> He's like, you will be in the third part, the, 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 the lowest part of hell, because you're, you're varying away from what was considered the truth. And not only that, not only will you be in hell, but your whole family would be in hell. And as a matter of fact, if you teach anything else, if you leave this room and you teach anything else other than this, then all of their blood is going to be on your hands. Before even any of the questions Before you have. Before any of the questions, man. And I was like, wow, this is intense. So when I begin to... I asked the question, I said, what do you think about, you know, in Corinthians where he's talking about, uh, Paul is talking about being, um, did anyone, did, did, why are you being divided? You know, some of, of, of Apollo, some of the- First Corinthians uh, 1. Yeah, yeah, First Corinthians 1, right, yeah. And he's like, you know, did, did, did any of them die for you? You know, was, was any of you baptized um, in my name? But he's not saying in literally baptizing in this, invoking Paul's name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just saying, you know, baptizing my authority, because that's what yeah. Jesus' name really means. And when I said that, oh my, when I asked that question and posed it like that, he was irate. He was so mad to the point to where he's like, listen, son, I don't know what's happening to you, but I think the devil's gotten into you and uh, you, you, you're going to have to step down. I don't want you on the platform anymore because this is what we believe. Um, are you telling me in the meetings, are you telling me after 50 years of, of me being in ministry and teaching, are you kind of telling me that I'm, the, I'm wrong, that I've been teaching wrong? Oh, wow. So when you're in that situation, you're like, man, I... I don't know what to tell you. I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong. The yeah. Bible says you're wrong, man. And that's from 4,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, I just don't see it. Yeah. In con- I'm just reading yeah. in context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And after that, man, he was like, you know what, son, you need to get out of here. I have another meeting, but um, you're going to step down. And I told, I told my pastor, I said, hey, I was willing to step down prior to coming into that meeting because I was like, I got to get my, my head right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am. But let me just, why don't we talk through this? So I was thinking that I was going to get maybe some other sessions with my pastor, that, that didn't happen. That yeah. a pastor will do what a pastor is supposed to do. Right, right. <laughs> Answer next, questions. Yeah, so yeah. the next day came, there was a service. I didn't go because I felt hurt. You know, I was crying, I was in tears because that never happened to me before. Mm-hmm. I'm, sitting, I'm sitting down in my room and uh, my wife goes to church with my kids and my dad who came from New York at that day. I get these phone calls, I get everybody blasting my, my, my phone, texting me like, yo, where you at, where you at, where you at? I was like, what's going on? Yo, the pastor is on the platform blasting you. Like he's calling your name out and he's, talk, he's saying how stupid you are, how dumb you are because he's all of a sudden changing his, his beliefs. And I'm like, okay, let me go online and let me see the service. Let me yeah. hear what he's got to say. Lo and behold, they, they, they turned the mic off. They turned the volume off so you couldn't hear no way. what was being said. But they turned it off after they announced my name over the pulpit. So at least people knew who, they, who he was talking about. Yeah. But I couldn't hear anything else. So wow! So it's just a, it's a, this immediate sort of PR thing and, and shunning thing, which is just so wild because yeah. I mean we're about to do a Q and A thing. I can, yeah. I can imagine if somebody asks a question and we turn and say that it's like wait, what? <laughs> you know, but yeah. it, honestly and seriously, it's, it's so antithetical to like what you think about what the Apostle Paul did. Would he he would go into the Areopagus and he would reason with the Stoics and the philosophers and he would work out in the arena of ideas where this is a area where it's like you should have that confidence as a Christian where it's like, hey, that's where, you know, you've seen those like debates with like James White between David Bernard. It's like the cross-examination right. that happens. Like right. that's where you have to be willing to have your beliefs and challenge. But I can only imagine that. Um, so yeah, it was really good. I think that well, like you're, you're hitting on a lot of good things. Um, just real quickly with this conference, I know you did the talk yesterday on spiritual abuse and you're, I, you're kind of reiterating your, of what you talked yeah, about with yeah, your yeah. experience. Mm-hmm. What has been kind of like your personal, like biggest takeaway just for 
uh, this conference and any, any aha moments that you'd like to share just that you've had so far? Yeah, no, I mean, this, this conference has been great, you know, um, sharing not only my story, but other stories that I've heard. It, it's just amazing to see how similar even other groups, not just my group, and how they all have the same type of experiences, whether it's uh, high controlling um, authoritarian groups, uh, 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 leadership, uh, whether it's just like the standards and just the way that things happen while they're in there and their transitions and how people are trying to find their way through this process. Yeah. And um, it's just amazing to see that even in the midst of all of the different types of groups that people can come together and try to do things in terms of this, where we can try to recover from the damages that have happened uh, through the groups that we've been a part of and to just see how people are you just know they're, they're, they're so genuine there's 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 even love here in spite of and there may be people that are hurt here but there are people that are desperately wanting to really find christ really understand their relationship with god and really be on the mm -hmm. path where they can finally receive peace it's just amazing to see here it, yeah isn't, isn't that weird too it's like the exact juxtaposition of when you went and talked to the bishop mm -hmm. like there's people from different denominations even in here that are coming out of legalism and they're getting together through the bounds of the holy spirit whereas when you talk to your bishop to ask questions all of a sudden you're questioning the one true church right meaning that all others are false mm -hmm. where there's non-essentials that we may differ with people in here yeah uh, that don't mean you're not saved and you can still right. commune together through the bonds of the holy spirit like right. all tribes peoples tongues and nations there's right. going to be some differences there but the essentials of the faith stay the same right so right. Do, what did you think when he was asking when he was telling you those things like with interactions you had with other people that maybe you thought were christian that weren't upci when you mm -hmm. were younger mm -hmm. um where you're like whoa i'm all of a sudden i'm in a cult yeah or like what was it what were you thinking um you mean after after that happened yeah yeah like man it was it, it was a game changer because i'm like wow when i was starting to meet other people after i left i realized that yeah like you were saying earlier like man there's a lot of people here like out of my like my group that are actually true christians because before i was always looking at if you're a trinitarian if you were even if you were a calvinist or something of that nature they were all like like lost you were all yeah. just not saved the devil's doctrine yeah like it, it was crazy but then after coming out and actually getting connected with other people who had uh different types of different you know maybe some subjects that might not be all you know all unified but at the same time there's common grounds in terms of salvation man it just blew my mind to know that there are more people out here that are actually truly saved and that uh, what was i what, what i was a part of is another gospel unfortunately yeah. and it hurts me because i have a lot of people i have my, my mom is still in it you know i have other friends and family family members that are still a part of these these groups and you're just praying that god will also at some point let the lights come on as well and pull that tapestry yeah. slowly but hopefully enough for the to, to be able to, to, to come out so, that's yeah. what we're seeing here that's what encourages me i think god is pulling that yeah, yeah. oh yeah 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 and some people are still in it but some of them are asking good questions and what i like about this here is that there's a lot of objectivity yeah. and i think once you're in some of these groups at least when i was in my church you lost the sense of objectivity to be able to sit down and reason with the scriptures and be able to evaluate is what i'm in really true is what i'm actually learning is it correct yeah is it in context so here a lot of objectivity and that's what gets people freedom awesome yeah. well leo thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us a little bit yeah, thank and you. uh yeah this has been great and this is gonna be a great rest of converse we're looking forward just to the rest of this time and i think what you've said is incredibly value for our audience. I'm looking forward to getting the feedback from that. Awesome, man. Awesome. awesome Thanks man. For having Appreciate me. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Thanks, Leo. What's up, everybody? It's the Super Sleuth here, letting you know that you can go to shopcultish.com and get all of our exclusive cultish merch. There's the Bad Theology Hurts People shirt. Jerry wears it all the time. I wear it all the time. Sometimes we wear it at the same time without even trying to have that happen on the show. And we're just like, whoa, you're wearing the shirt. I'm wearing the shirt. You could wear the shirt too. Go to shopcultish.com today and get your exclusive cultish merch. Talk to you later, guys. All right. So we're uh, the last little segment of our uh, little pod live podcast to be recorded later. But uh, we're here with uh, Michael. Uh, good to talk to you, man. Yeah, good to be here, man. Yeah, so um, this is really interesting. So we did a series initially with John Collins uh, talking about William Branham yes. and the message. And that was like a six-part series. So you were part of the message your whole life. I was. I was born into it. You're born into the message. You're born into William Branham's group. So the majority of your life, you saw him as the prophet, the latter reign, all, like, all the restoration theology that he taught. And... 
here you're here <laughs> yeah it's been a crazy journey um and you know like just coming from him being the end all be all yeah um you know salvation being tied to the movement that was created um by him around him um <laughs> uh to now where like jesus christ is the absolute yeah um and it's all i need is life-changing and Amen. just uh so different in so many different ways yeah what was like, I mean, explain what, what was life sort of like week to week in William Brennan? I mean, I've only really dealt in the conversation we have with John Collins, understanding like the history. Like I was very fascinated. If you haven't listened to our series, it's like watching kind of like a boardwalk empire show of like the 1920s. It's like a, an Avengers of like 1920s villains. Right. Right. But, um, but when you think about it, this is like your life. What was week to week life like? Sunday services, community. What's take us into that world if you could? Yeah. So growing up in the message, it was a very very loving community. Yeah. So you know you felt very accepted and you felt really understood um, because it was you know hyper fundamental. It's like there were a lot of you know things that you didn't do um, or that you did do that set you apart. Um, and so you know the community gave you a safe haven to be, you know, yourself and you felt understood. Um, so there was a lot of church growing up. Um, growing up, I went to church three times a week, uh, yeah. Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I was a kid. I didn't understand hardly anything. Um, so that was an amazing, you know, nap session for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, but yeah. And, and then as I got older, I began to understand a little bit more. Um, and I think there were definitely points of it that I just never understood. Um, and it was one of those things where I just, you know, I just put it on the shelf and I didn't dare tell my friends about it. Um, as a matter of fact, I had friends who were not in the movement. And I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I think it was probably frowned upon a little bit or just like, yeah. you know, I don't quite understand that. Um, but I was, you know, um, very, at least I would say like maybe... <laughs> I was a worship leader within the movement. And so I think I, you know, I experienced like high visibility within the movement. So yeah. being a worship leader, uh, I found such great purpose in that. Right? Yeah. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It, it, it was fulfilling to serve and to see how God was using my gift to um, reach people. What, yeah. what, what were the, some of the songs like? Were there any songs praising William Branham? Uh, definitely. Um, really? There, there, like, so in the message, there's just a lot of um, terms. Uh, that have mm. been, you know, specially coined that are related to the movement, right? Um, so, you know, people would write revelated songs, right? Um, and I, I'm also a songwriter. And so being influenced by the movement, I also wrote songs that oh, were, wow. I wouldn't say praised William Brandon, but definitely like upheld the standards of the message and included terminology that probably only a message believer would really understand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at, at least... Maybe surface level, yeah. people who weren't in the movement could, oh, this is a great song. But like, mm -hmm. um, if you were in the message, it had a completely different meaning for you. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's you know, interesting. Yeah. Just like like words, um, you know, the idea of like living in the last days and um, God preparing a, a bride, you know, who's like yeah. one in a million and, you know, this very elitist um, nature. Um, and then there were songs that I think as I, <laughs> the closer I was, to transitioning out of the message, there was more of a focus on mm -hmm. writing songs about Jesus Christ. And, yeah. and it, it, they kind of lacked some of that message um, lingo or buzzwords, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and so, you know, some of those songs, I'm like, man, maybe I should like rewrite them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but... Um, mm -hmm. It but is what it is, right? It, it is what it is, you know, and I, I think I could have only... You know, I, I didn't understand, you know, it, right. it's a very psychological thing. Good thing grace is real. Yeah. So true. Yeah. So Amen. true. Yeah. You're forgiven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So, um, I don't like, so there are songs that I've written that are still, that are out there. And I'm like, man, like I was really part of that. And like, they're still being sung. I'm like, oh no, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm helping to spread it, you know, yeah, but, man. but I, you know, it, grace, right. Grace. I, you know, I was where I was and I was, I was captivated by, by this, loving uh, movement yeah. and, 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 and figure that was adored and, you know, that was very charismatic and humble. And yeah. So, so he, he's dead when you're in it. So who was teaching? Uh, pastors, you know, um, 
you know, they, 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 they're, they're really big. Well, the, well, it depends on what sect you're from, but like the fivefold ministry basically where it's like, um, it's in season yeah. that, um, and so like, you know, there, so that you have pastors who, who, who spread the, the message of William Branham. Um, and then everyone else, you know, they go out and try to convert people. Yeah. Um, basically to recruit more message believers, mm -hmm. not quite people to Christ. Yeah. Right. Although it'll, it'll, it'll say to yeah. Christ, but we understand the oh, implication yeah. of what they mean by Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know? What do they mean by Christ? What they mean by Christ is, well, there, there's a, there's a famous, um, mentality in the message that the message is Christ. Um, and so, it, and so, you know, it's like it, it's a very um, indirect, basically tie back, uh, a tie back that almost reveres William Branham as God. And and, and I know that like a message believer who hears that would say like, oh, that's not true, but it's like, yeah, Christ is on the earth again, and the Messiah anointing and. It's in the ministry of William Branham. Whoa. And so, and, and then statements like, you can't separate the messenger from the message. Right. So it's like, okay. Um, yeah. It, so so yeah. it begins to yeah. be really blurry and then open up to interpretation for a lot of people to then deify him, yeah. which they have. I mean, it, like in Deuteronomy 18, it says if someone comes and they speak in the name of Yahweh, like so Moses, when he's speaking as a prophet, people looked upon that as the voice of God. So right. if you're being consistent, and William Branham is a prophet. He's speaking for Yahweh. Yeah. And no, exactly. Well, it, well, he's seen as the mouthpiece of God. Yeah. And then his message then empowers the believers uh, to believe that they are, and I quote, the final voice to the final age. And so, and, yeah. and then you're even um, encouraged or you, you, uh, you're given this ideology that you are little um, messiahs. Um, oh really? Like, like like you are little gods. You oh you know that. So it's it's just very yeah. And, and I think some of that came from <laughs> Mormonism and you know like the message is really like a hodgepodge of like a it's lot. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of syncretism. A lot of it. Yeah. Let me ask you this because we're a limited time here, and maybe we could figure out time to talk with you further about this. But you know you're here with your whole family. Yeah. Is that your wife back over there? It's my wife. She's there, looking yeah. at you beaming with I pride did. and put her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you know, usually. This is like your whole family left, though. Like, just wow. can you give us like a, a Cole Cliff notes? Like, I know you're all back there. I think I talked with her a little bit and some others. Mm -hmm. Like, how praise God? What was like the, just very quickly? I it brought, there's a whole broad a whole other story in of itself. Yes, but um, like what was the kind of the catalyst? What was the usually there usually there's like a straw that breaks the camel's back where you begin to really question and then you mm -hmm. leave. But a lot of times when it's a lot of times I think it's like there's a cut the story of Jim and Judy Robertson who left Mormonism. Both of them were going kind of through their own process of kind of like deconstruction of Mormonism, but they didn't talk to each other. But finally, they talked to each other. Both of them realized they were going through this whole questioning process. Yes. Like just grow a cliff notes. What was it like for you and your family? And you're all here now. So, you know, Dorcas and I um, were in a place where we were just not understanding the message or not finding it applicable to our lives. Yeah. And we were like, no, we, we need a gospel that that, that can give us victory through the week that we can, like we need a relatable Jesus Christ, you know? And so while we were going that, we weren't necessarily trying to transition out of the message. Um, we were just looking for more relatable truth. Well, while we were doing that, um, her family was actually, um, had already transitioned out of the message. And so we were like, oh my gosh, you guys are crazy. Like, <laughs> like how could you leave like this, this end time truth that's, you know, yeah. changed our lives. And, um, and then so, you know, talking with them like we, we began to study the scripture for ourselves um and it started you know our own journey and then you know it all all it takes is like one hole right and right. you begin to unravel out of it and, and 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 you begin to understand like the jesus of the bible is is not what i've been told like mm -hmm. he was um he's much more he's much more gracious and 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 loving and so much more powerful than the diminished version uh that i grew up with um, and so it's been amazing, like having, you know, that side of the family that's out of it, that's that, that we've been able to have community with, um, and grow together and, 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 and have Bible study with. Yeah. So when we heard about this conference, it was, 
it was it was a no brainer. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. And, and just real quickly, what would be what's been like the biggest takeaway like from this? I mean, I know I met you like right after I did my talk, mm -hmm. um, and Andrew obviously gave his talk this morning. There's been a lot of great panels. Uh, Natalie's been fantastic. Jennifer's been fantastic. But what, what would you say? What would be a big like aha moment that's really been here like this entire weekend? I think the the big aha moment for me from this weekend um, has just been how beautiful and how powerful the gospel is in its simplicity yeah. and mm. how it's just affected everyone who's who, yeah. who, who, who who've come out of movements yeah. that you know that run the spectrum of pseudo Christianity yeah right but like the nearness mm -hmm. um, and the shared joy and yeah. experience that we yeah. have when we come to the true meaning of the gospel mm -hmm. it's like man it's, it really is just that simple and like you know also i'm not the only one who was a victim of these things but praise god like yeah there's there's hope there's love there's redemption outside of that movement yeah and man i'm so happy to be here oh, <laughs> you know? for, for sure you know it's really cool as we wrap up here is that um and andrew you can be your, your final thoughts is that you know, there is like birds of a feather on both sides sure. so there's other groups whether it's the holiness groups or, you know, any, anyone from any of the other backgrounds that we've had and you from William Branham, right. um, you know, the one is apostolic, any of those movements, there's, there's sort of that legalism, that bondage and your identities in that, you know, charismatic leader. Sure. But then you see the exact opposite where you look at the, our con this conference called call to freedom. Mm -hmm. You think of that scripture where it says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes. So it's like, we're here as Christians there's lots of secondary issues that are there, you know, whether it's reformed, Arminian, egalitarian, complementarian, like all these like secondary issues. But we're like unified where we understand that there's true like freedom in the yes. gospel and a true like relationship yes. with God that comes about through Jesus. And that's where like true freedom comes about. So, yeah, man, it's been really cool. And like and it's also interesting too. like you mentioned that uh, our series, in case anyone who's listening to this, Who's next, Brandon Mike? We did a series with John Collins on uh, William Bram. It's a six-part series that goes from his very origins to how things ended in a very weird way with Jim Jones. Like, what was your biggest takeaway from that series? From that series, I, I think it really helped me to understand the history of the movement. Um, starting out, I think that was very. Um, I wasn't expecting that when I first started listening to it. I, yeah. I, I thought it would just, you know, kind of like come at like. Maybe the inconsistencies that exist, right? Yeah. Um, but starting from the like the very beginning, it, it really um, solidified um, or and, and was very eye opening um, to like where it started and like where the where some of the doctrine started and um, just you know I live in a, a life of context now and that's so yeah. important. <laughs> um, so understanding the context of like how he actually grew up yeah. um, and the context of his life that likely shaped a lot of his ideologies. Um, it, it kind of put everything into focus and honestly put Christ more into focus in my life. Wow. I understood like, wow, this isn't um, gospel truth as I thought it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this is probably just more tied to a personal um, arriving of its own. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. Andrew, any last uh, thoughts on just this little boss podcast as we kind of wrap up here at the call it we got a QA we gotta do so yeah. uh no i think i think the way michael ended it right there is perfect like awesome that, that's the goal right is for people to know christ and to make christ known for sure yeah. excellent so if you guys enjoyed this podcast definitely know what you thought and uh hopefully we will see you all on the road next time whenever our next live event is i'm not sure when that will be but we get out on the road every now and then out of our out of and every now every now and then has to get out of a secret super secret headquarters I had to get out of Phoenix. It was 120 degrees. So I'm taking the humidity as an exchange. So all that being said, thank you all for listening in. And we'll talk to you all next time on Cultish. Talk to you guys soon. What's up, everybody? If you are blessed by this content and you want to support the gospel's proclamation to the cults while equipping the church to combat deception, then come join us and become a Cultish All Access member. You will get an ad-free experience and exclusive content like Cultish the Water Cooler, where you hang out with Jeremiah and myself as we go live and interact with all of our members. You'll also get early release of episodes one to two weeks early. On top of all of that, there's also Cultish the Aftermath. It's an after show commentary where we get to say all of the things that they won't let us. On top of that, you get all of the other training 
on apologiastudios.com. Come be one of us. Head over to thecultishow.com or follow the link in the show notes and click the join button. Directly support the work of this ministry as the mission is completely funded by you, our listener.